I'll talk about is how do you look at taking a machine learning model into production? How do you monitor the model, uh, model? and kind of uh, talk about the different aspects of a responsible AI system. So, uh, so responsible AI is something that is talked a lot in the industry. It was called, I mean, uh, there are different terminologies. You could look at it. Uh, some people call it ethical AI. But in general, the idea is that uh, as you build machine learning models, you kind of look at uh, uh, the fairness metrics, the ethical considerations of it, and get into the more of uh, how do you have a standardization across the board of how you deploy machine learning models. So I'll talk about some patterns. Again, these are not like, uh, 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 like st set in stone. I mean, these things are evolving. So definitely you'll see new things coming in this direction. So my, my goal of this workshop will be just to give you, uh, uh, equip you with enough uh, patterns where you can understand that this is what is uh, happening. These are some of the best tools as of now for this particular application. And then you can, uh, as new new technologies come in, new tools come in, you can kind of consider them for uh, a particular problem. So we'll start with uh, the first half session. We'll focus more on uh, why we need responsible AI. It will be slightly less technical. It will be focused on uh, what are the, some of the problems we face with AI systems? Talk, lot, uh, we'll talk about AI fairness and bias. And I'll just introduce some of the tenets that we see from the responsible AI perspective. And the second half will focus more on actual implementation, looking at metrics, monitoring, and uh, explanations. Uh, I'll give some reference architectures, which, uh, which are right now uh, very popular in the industry. And uh, again, as I said, these things keep evolving, so there's nothing set in stone. Uh, I have a couple of demonstrations, basically Jupyter notebooks that talk about uh, how this is done. And depending on time, I'll, I'll, I can walk you through the, the code examples uh, as, we, as we progress. A little bit about myself and uh, uh, I mean, this, this is already done. Like, uh, so I, I lead the AI research team at uh, Persistent. Uh, uh, Persistent is a, uh, is a global company. We have offices all across the world, uh, headquartered in India in Pune. Uh, I'm based out of Goa, uh, which is, uh, we have a 500 people office here uh, where I'm, I'm located. And uh, we have offices in Europe, North America, about half a billion uh, dollar company. Uh, primary focus of us is on uh, banking and the healthcare and getting into industrial and high tech. Uh, I'm also the author of the book, uh, Keras to Kubernetes. Uh, this talks about taking a machine learning model and uh, deploying it into production. So uh, yeah, that, that was something I developed. And uh, before Persistent, I worked at GE uh, at Research, Energy, and Transportation, like was mentioned. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so first, what is the need for responsible AI, and how does this term come into place? Now, as you know, I mean, I'm uh, uh, most likely preaching to a choir here. Uh, data is the new oil in today's system. The companies with the more data, those are the ones who are becoming successful. And AI is the new uh, electricity. This is the term that uh, Dr. Andrew Ng coined. So we, we need AI to process this large volumes of data and make sense out of it. Uh, but again, with great powers come great responsibility. So we see these headlines, like you, you may have read some of these, uh, the algorithms are being used to grade essays. <clears throat> and then uh, may, if, what if the algorithm is flawed? I mean, it's not, you wouldn't compare that to performance of a human teacher. Same thing now, if you are, you are applying for a loan or a healthcare uh, insurance coverage, now algorithms, machine learning algorithms are playing a role there. So what if these algorithms are biased? They take unnecessary or unintentional features and make a decision based on that. Uh, how, how do you tackle that? So, and how do you quantify that? How do you know that your algorithm that you're building is not actually doing that? I mean, that, that's the one aspect of responsible AI. The second aspect is talking about hidden uh, technical depth and reproducibility. This is a nice paper I highly encourage. And I have a references at the end, which has links to all this also. Uh, and I believe the slides will be made available uh, either on GitHub or uh, directly by Anna. Uh, so here we are talking, this is a nice Google research paper that talks about uh, the actual ML code when you, when in, in the actual production, the actual ML code kind of is a pretty smaller piece of it. And this is, there are established libraries, established algorithms. There are so many things you can try and evaluate what is best for your particular problem. The, the majority of effort kind of goes into finding the configuration, collecting the data, uh, doing the feature extraction, process management, uh, serving infrastructure and monitoring the model. So uh, if you are not paying attention to that, especially in the, in the, in the industry, uh, you end up building a lot of technical depth. And then when you, when you want to um, make the system 
improve the quality of the system you end up spending a lot of time correcting these things and less time on the actual model so now uh, if you see in the industry a lot of uh, uh, machine learning platforms are being evolved, are being evolved which tend to take care of these different concerns so that the uh, data scientists can focus on the actual ml process or the ml engineer can focus on the algorithm and the rest of the things the platforms try to take <clears throat> take into account a lot of uh, platforms like h2o.ai data robot kind of tend to handle this issue the other problem is on reproducibility so this this is an interesting uh, article uh, from nature magazine where they conducted a survey of uh, of 1500 data uh, 1500 researchers now this is just in general and uh, this they found that there was a major reproducibility uh, crisis in the sense a lot of papers are published with a very high accuracy numbers 90% 99% but then you can't really reproduce the code either the code is not shared or it is not in the state where you can read and we we run this a lot one to this a lot i mean we get excited about a new research but it becomes difficult to actually reproduce if all the components are not provided so it the, so it backs a lot of standardization and this happens a lot in industry also like if you take a big organization a lot of our customers they have many data scientists who kind of prefer their own tools own way of doing feature engineering so it it works when you are solving a, a an isolated problem but when you have to combine your efforts you kind of run into a mismatch and that causes a lot of effort to actually standardize things again uh, the technical depth uh, problem so uh, this is something that is very relevant in industry and these two are the main reasons why a lot of people are talking about reproducibility one is the ethical implications the fairness part and second is the reproducibility and technical depth so a responsible ai system uh, should ideally focus on both aspects to give you uh, enough uh, ammunition to tackle both this problem so let's quantify and make sure that you don't have this problem so we will take them one step at a time so we'll start with the uh, ethics of ai systems and uh, just some examples uh, these uh, these are just news articles that i picked up uh, amazon as you saw i mean some of the problems w- w- uh, that we have seen in the industry amazon introduced a recruiting tool and that was highly biased against women and the reason was that uh, this tool was trained on data that was historical and uh, historically they were different because of different regions uh, uh, women were less <coughs> selected for certain jobs or they they there were less women applicants so the, that inherent bias kind of crept up in this tool and the tool started becoming uh, 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 biased now this was definitely not something amazon wanted to do but it just happened because the data was biased so your algorithm got biased and uh, now there are tools and i'll, I'll show an example of one of these tools uh, which can actually uh, help you measure quantify the bias in your algorithm and uh, uh, there are tools by which you can even mitigate it because uh, and and while training second example is the more recent one apple card i mean this became very popular especially in social media when uh, so apple introduced this apple payments card in uh, i believe with uh, golden golden sacks and uh, uh, they, they they would assign some credit limit to different folks based on different factors and uh, it was found that uh, the, the, the uh, under the same condition um, a male and a female would get uh, different credit lines in fact there was a 10 10x difference and this was pointed out in a tweet by steve wozniak himself that he, he and him and his wife do having the same exact uh, <coughs> uh, features uh, uh, factors affecting their credit they got uh, two different uh, credit lines in fact, so this was a major issue and i think this was discontinued and uh, this is an example of fairness through unawareness it's a term in the industry where uh, it's actually one of the definitions of fairness is uh, you you don't you don't really consider I mean, you don't consider a bias you just collect data and do it and you don't check if the data has a bias so this was a classic case of that it's not un- definitely not intentional but this bias comes into the system and the last uh, this is a classic example of uh, in any ai fairness class you will see this example this was the compass uh, software which was developed uh, uh, and used extensively by the us justice department and uh, it it basically had a questionnaire which was either filled by the inmate so this was for the judicial system so uh, the inmates either filled it themselves or uh, somebody else would fill a representative would fill it for the inmates and it would ask questions like prior commitment prior crimes uh, the locality where the inmate was living um, uh, and different uh, personal questions and based on that it would create a score of uh, recidivism in the sense uh, the score that will that what, what is the probability that that particular person who who has committed a crime will commit the crime again and uh, this was highly biased 
to a particular race uh, or against a particular race, I should say. And uh, you could see from the snapshots that uh, uh, that people of different races were given different uh, ratings, though rest of the conditions were remaining same. So this was a major uh, controversy, and uh, this Compass software was discontinued. Um, so this just wanted to highlight that this is a major issue that uh, that uh, our AI systems have to deal with, and definitely this is not an intentional issue, but it crept, it comes up in the AI systems. So one of the things we definitely need to consider is how do you measure fairness? Now, this is an interesting study because uh, fairness itself, there are multiple definitions of fairness. And what happens is these definitions often uh, contrast each other. So one of the more comp, uh, older definitions is fairness to unawareness that I'm not considering uh, that attribute at all. So if I have a data set, I'm not considering gender or race at all. So in that case, uh, my, whatever algorithm, whatever model I build, Will, will not be biased by that um, that feature. Now this has been proven extensively as a uh, as a false notion. Even though you eliminate that particular feature from your data set, what happens is these features are heavily heavily correlated. So the bias does creep in. I mean, people have shown studies where, uh, in fact, I may be able to if I have time, I can show you a notebook with a similar example where you uh, even though you remove uh, uh, of that particular feature, you can still see that uh, that once you put that feature back in the results tend to get biased so this is something that a lot of uh, a lot of researchers have studied and fairness to unawareness just doesn't work some of the other definitions are around demographic parity and uh, 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 sorry statistical parity and uh, 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 i think it's called uh, 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 yeah so demographic parity this tends to look at how the uh, what is the likelihood of a positive outcome? So it only looks at the selection rate. It doesn't look at the performance of a classifier. So this is something, and we will we'll talk about a couple of these metrics when I show the example. Uh, counterfactual fairness is also something that is heavily studied where you will the decision change if a particular uh, pro protected attribute, and this, in the legal terms, these are called protected attributes like race, gender. If the protected attribute is changed. You change that particular feature from male to female. Will the outcome change? And that's what counterfactual studies. And then a couple of more mathematical uh, definitions are equal opportunity and equalize odds, and you can read up there. So uh, there are libraries which can help you <clears throat> look at your uh, data and tell you if what sort of these fairness metrics uh, exist and how do they, uh, I mean, how does your data set work, work against these metrics? Uh, so this is um, uh, this is actually uh, an Excel uh, uh, just a, which helps you calculate this metrics. So like oftentimes these metrics, you tend to metrics uh, are uh, very difficult, but it's not really the case. I mean, all you need is the calculate this metric. So I, I can uh, kind of in one of our blogs at pers uh, at persistent. I kind of uh, um, uh, made this uh, Excel sheet available. You can, uh, I won't show it in this class, but you can read the, read up on this. Basically what you can do is you can consider two scenarios. Uh, in one case, group one is a ma uh, is male and group two is a uh, female. And you can consider the predicted versus actual. So what it does is uh, uh, you just have to fill in the gray columns where just take a hypothetical scenario. You don't even need to worry about the features because the objective is to see how, how the metrics are calculated. So you just assume that you are solving for a particular uh, case. You just find the predicted versus actual and uh, just populate these columns and it will calculate your true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. It will calculate your confusion metrics. And based on that, it will calculate some of your perform statistical performance metrics like precision, recall, et cetera. And then it will calculate uh, these uh, fairness metrics for, because fairness metrics uh, depend on the group. So you calculate the precision uh, recall in the males and calculate in, in, female, in the female group, and then you compare. So based on that, these four metrics are calculated automatically for you. Disparate impact ratio, uh, statistical parity difference, equal opportunity difference, and equalize odd difference. And these are the formulas. So it's, it's not uh, rocket science. I mean, these are very straightforward. Just in this Excel sheet, you can calculate these. And you could use one of these tools, like uh, IBM has this AI Fairness 360, and Google has this what if tool. Uh, you could look at this and uh, try to calculate this fairness matrix. So uh, uh, since I have like uh, 10 minutes, let me just pull this pull this AI fairness 360 up. Uh, 
uh, if you are not seeing this, I'll, I'll give you a five sec, five minute, uh, just an overview. Uh, it is a library which will help you. You can pass your data set to it. Uh, of course, you had to do some feature engineering, make it numeric and others. But once you give the data set, it will tell you what are some of the metrics that are calculated. And uh, what I really like is they have a very nice web demo. So this web demo uh, light, lets you just uh, on the fly uh, calculate some of the statistical uh, fairness matrices. So let me, so what it does is first let you select a data set. Let's choose uh, the compass data set, the famous compass data set and the protected attributes are sex and race. And uh, let's do next. Now what it is doing is on the fly, on the fly for that particular compass data set. Now compass is a famous data set. It's released in, uh, you will have, you'll get it on GitHub. It is calculating these particular um, uh, matrices. So you can see the statistical parity difference uh, is coming as minus 0.36 and uh, uh, which is coming as bias. The reason is, and you can, uh, it has a very nice explanation of it. The, fat, the statistical parity difference typically should be between minus 0.1 and 0.1. And this is the definition of what the statistical parity difference is. Is basically the favorable. I mean, this is pretty. This is the metric that is often used in legal terms, or in legal cases also. How favorable is one group versus the other group, keeping all other factors same? So, uh, difference between the favorable outcomes received by the unprivileged group to the uh, privileged group. That is what is calculated as a statistical parity difference. And this is the paper which introduced this term. So this. Uh, I really like this tool. It, it right here, it gives you the definition, it gives you a calculation, and it gives you the paper uh, that uh, uh, that uh, brings this up. Same way, there's equal opportunity difference, average odds, and disparate impact. Uh, and this is more based on entropy fields index. And you can look at one of these matrices and uh, using the library, you can apply it to your, uh, your uh, data set. Now, the next thing is once you select, uh, say, okay, you, you know that this data set is biased. There is a bias on uh, sex then you could do is you could apply one of the uh, debiasing techniques. So this is something that is gaining popularity now. Now you, you don't know that your data set had bias. You tried this out from the metric, you know, okay, your uh, data set has bias. Now, how do you mitigate the bias? Now you, you can go sample new data set, but uh, many times in the real world, the data will have a bias. So there are some debiasing techniques which you can apply, which is more, more like they're adding some noise to your data set and they help you uh, reduce the bias. So you, the result that you get uh, may not be 100% reflecting the reality, reality, but it tries to do a trade-off that, okay, uh, we add some noise, but because of that, we are removing the bias and uh, we get a little less accurate data set, but it's probably in many cases is acceptable for training a mach machine learning model. So this can be done at three levels. One is you can do it at a reweighing stage where you apply different weightages to the data. So, uh, and then this kind of talks and then there's a very good paper that comes with uh, IBM 360 uh, that talks about details of each of these techniques. So it's, it's pretty good site for you to try out. So you can do it at the data level where you can reweigh the, uh, the, the inputs, or you could do it at uh, the classifier level, which is more of an adversarial debiasing where you actually train a, 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 another classifier to adjust the uh, to, uh, accuracy based on your uh, uh, calculations. And then the final one is the is you can do it at the prediction level. So here actually you're tweaking the predictions because if it is a borderline prediction, then you are actually making it to, to an underprivileged class because uh, you want to mitigate the bias. So the, these are the three uh, uh, techniques you can do. And in, in this tool, you can just select one of the, the techniques and just say next. And it will actually apply this technique and uh, uh, so it'll actually apply this technique and give you the new uh, uh, new new value of uh, say statistical parity difference. So it was 0.36 before. Now it is it has made it into minus 0 0.03, which is acceptable as far as the the thumb the rule of uh, thumb case uh, where uh, 0.1 to minus 0.1 is acceptable. So now it actually did a debiasing and gave you the result back. So this one this is a pretty handy tool. It explains to you how the uh, how the data set has a bias, uh, how you measure it, and then uh, how do you apply some sort of a debiasing technique to actually reduce the bias. So now you, when you use it to train your model, you have a more confidence that this uh, particular uh, data set doesn't have a bias and that will not be passed over to your uh, ML model. So that's kind of a, in a high level uh, overview. Let's come back to the uh, 
to the slide. So that's uh, basically how uh, statistical bias works and uh, some of the metrics for it. And uh, this Excel sheet, which is on my link on the persistent post, uh, this is really available. It can also uh, help you kind of uh, measure some of these by hand. I mean, you could actually write a Python code to measure all these things on your own, or you could download one of these libraries and do it yourself. The second part of uh, the class, I'll focus on uh, 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 talking about responsible AI. So uh, definitely the first aspect is uh, uh, AI fairness and how you build a system that can, uh, uh, where we know what the bias is and how do you measure a bias. This, uh, now, this other aspect of responsible AI, now let's talk about some, what are the five uh, tenets of responsible AI that I mentioned earlier. So the first one is uh, uh, reproducibility. So this is again, uh, along with uh, the Google research paper that we saw, we want to standardize the machine learning process and build an MLOps pipeline. And uh, some of the patterns that are used for this is something like a data catalog. Many times you, uh, you have the data scientists work on a CSV file and show some amazing results, but then the other data scientists cannot uh, reproduce it. I mean, they basically use Git to share these files, but as the file size increases, this kind of is a uh, is a constraint for them. So we kind of, there's a pattern coming up of using a data catalog. There are tools like DVC, data version control, and I'll show an example of that. That can help you, uh, uh, that can help you, uh, that can help you version the data and uh, take the, and so that all the data scientists are working on the same version. The same thing goes for model. There is a pattern called model catalog or model registry by which once you train a model, you can check it into that. And uh, now that particular version, you know that model version is running at a particular location and uh, you can, um, uh, I mean, the, so you can reproduce the results. Same thing, the next uh, big area is transparency. Here we talk about interpretability and explainability of models. Interpretability typically means uh, your model is inherently explainable. So something like a random forest, you know, based on what it has learned, you, it can give you the ranking of the features. You can tell you why a particular decision was made. Uh, explainability comes into play when the models are more, um, uh, the, uh, it's more like the black box models. You kind of either have a surrogate model or some other technique like a, a SHAP scores kind of a technique, which will help you explain an, a black box model. And then fairness, we talked about a lot. Uh, how do you maintain fairness? So transparency is the second aspect. And the third aspect is accountability. Uh, how do you make your AI systems policy driven? When do you bring a human in the loop? And what, what metrics, what monitors do you uh, have to the system? So in this uh, workshop, we'll talk more on the, these three areas. The two other aspects, which we won't talk much, but we are, which are equally important is uh, security and privacy. Security is to make your machine learning model more or AI system more secure so that uh, now you hear a lot of things about uh, ML systems being attacked, adversarial learning, adversarial attacks, and uh, can you encrypt your uh, model so that even during inference, you keep the entire model and the data encrypted so that the results are not shared and there is no leak of the data. And privacy becomes all the more important in today's world with so many data brand, uh, with the GDPR in, uh, uh, in, in Europe, it's, uh, it's a major, uh, uh, major regulation which mandates privacy of AI ML models. And there are techniques like federated learning and differential privacy, which help you achieve this. Uh, we won't talk a lot. I mean, uh, my team actually works a lot on these two areas. So if there are questions, I can take it offline or, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. But uh, for this, I'm focusing more on uh, the three areas, reproducibility, transparency, and accountability. So what, what I'll do is in the remaining time, uh, I'll take a scenario where we'll show a general ML pipeline and we'll apply these principles of reproducibility, transparency, accountability to that, show how that is applied. Uh, then um, uh, we'll take a break and uh, we'll come back and then I'll show the couple of demos, which actually uh, see where you can see this in, in action. So let's start. Uh, so first, this would be a typical way of how the current uh, uh, ML ops kind of a, a cycle would be. Your data scientists will have a development environment. Uh, you'll be doing the data preparation. Uh, you'll build a model uh, using, I mean, typically Python is pretty preferred, but the same thing applies to R or any other languages. Uh, you could do the testing and validation of your model. And once you are satisfied, so you typically test for your statistical performance. You you either do like this confusion metrics, you build a uh, uh, receiving operators, characteristics, uh, ROC curve, uh, and different types of other uh, other metrics 
and you check the statistical performance of your model on your training data and validation data. And then once you're happy with that, you deploy that to production. The model gets deployed in a production environment. There is a production uh, serving engine. Uh, to, in today's world, uh, yeah, microservices approach is getting very popular. So you package the model as a Docker container or a microservice and deploy it. And then uh, there is some logging provided by the, by the ecosystem where you're deploying your model. And then you do, typically you do service level performance where you, you monitor the performance of the service. Like if you have deployed it as a REST service, you would see how many inference calls did it receive? How many times it was down? Uh, how many times there was an error? So it is more of a health and a service level performance that you do. Uh, not, not, a lot, not always you kind of get into the actual details. Like is your accuracy good? Is your accuracy improving? Is the data that you are supplying to you for inference, is that having a drift? Now that is what is important when you're looking at ML model because a lot of times what happens is you, you, you're happy with your, uh, uh, the data scientist is happy that the model has gives you good precision recall on the training and validation data set. But once you put it in production, the results are not that great. And the reason is you are not really, your production system may be uh, out of distribution compared to your uh, training data. It may not be a good representation of production. So there are several cases. So it, it is important for you to monitor your production and then uh, at the right time, trigger a retraining of the model and collect the right data so that uh, you, your, um, uh, your development environment becomes a representation of production. So uh, let's see uh, some ideas. And again, I, I'm saying this is not something set in stone. The, I'm, I'm sure you guys may even come up with a better way of doing this, but these are some ideas to bring in uh, reproducibility, transparency, and uh, accountability to this system. So first let's talk about uh, reproducibility. So here, uh, what we could do is instead of having like a CSV or a, a, a central database for, for getting your data and the, uh, each data scientist, typically this is a multi, uh, like a, a network environment where multiple data scientists work on. Uh, instead of having multiple data scientists kind of just access CSVs, you could have a data catalog pattern here where uh, you def define uh, that uh, this is the version of the data that you want to work on and your data scientist can take that uh, version of the data, pull that version from the repository and build a model on that. So another data scientist can compare to a similar, uh, to the same version and both are working exactly on the apples to apples comparison data set. Uh, now there is, uh, the modern systems are also talking about feature store because uh, you take the da raw data from one of these data catalogs then you apply a lot of feature engineering to it. You either uh, do a label encoding, you do a data cleansing, removing NAs. So a lot of feature engineering goes into it to clean the data and make it available for an ML system. So uh, another pattern that is being very popular is uh, using a feature store where after the data is cleansed and the features are extracted, these, that is checked into a feature store. So instead of a data catalog with your raw data, you uh, store your features into a feature store. And uh, the same features are used for your training as well as for your uh, uh, inference. So now there is a very uniformity in the way of the model uh, of the data. The same, uh, same patterns are applied to both. So that becomes very uh, standardized. And the third one is the model catalog or we can call it uh, model registry where uh, once the model is created, instead of uh, just saving it as a pickle file or a save file, and then uh, shipping it on a, putting it on a Git, GitHub server. We have a formal model registry which maintains the versions. Uh, so these binary files are checked into the model registry. Uh, the versions are maintained. And then uh, when you do the production deployment, you directly take the model file from the repository and do a deployment. So this is analogous to how a software deployment will happen in an agile world, in the DevOps world. You would have a Jenkins pipeline, which will, uh, once you check in your code, the pipeline will be triggered and it will take in the right version of the code, that particular branch and build, 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 build uh, the executable for you, uh, the continuous integration, and then deploy that executable into production, continuous deployment. So the same thing, same patterns we are applying to machine learning. The only difference is here, the focus is a lot more on data. You need to version the data, not just your code. And then you know, uh, you, model is a very important artifact. You don't have uh, just an exe which is uh, which is being uh, which has to be uh, developed again you you can have the same model the same binary file which you develop the data scientist develops that can be put in a model catalog and reused when you're deploying it to production 
so that is about reproducible so that will bring some amount of reproducibility to your uh, ml uh, life cycle now what about transparency so uh, one way to introduce transparency is uh, you look at uh, uh, you add you look at explanations as well as metrics so the data scientist looks at the metrics like your uh, roc curve but at the same time you have a pipeline and i'll show an example of that pipeline that will also generate your explanation so once the model is developed why is the model making a decision so you can have a like a feature uh, important chart like this this is generated using shap shap is basically a shapely global explanation library it uses game theory uh, i mean what it does basically is once the model is there uh, for every prediction it will assign some shap score to each feature and uh, a shap score to the output so you know which feature is giving importance so this kind of a chart is a global chart global explanation by combining the shape features of all your training data so you know that uh, the first feature here uh, in this case it's uh, credit history is more important while making a decision uh, compared to uh, some of the uh, other features so explanations is something you definitely want to track uh, we talked about fairness you want to include fairness matrices here so that uh, you can uh, you know that your data set is not uh, biased in fact there is there is a school of thought that you should have the fairness uh, metrics right in the uh, in the data catalog or the feature catalog itself so when you before you check in a data set in into your data catalog you want to do the fairness analysis also make sure the data set is fair otherwise you may want to debias the inputs and uh, take the data I mean, this is something that uh, is also being discussed uh, in the industry and then uh, the transparency doesn't have to be limited at the data scientist level it needs to be in the operations level itself so more than the service performance what you really need is uh, a, a data and a concept drift kind of a measurement so data drift is basically when your feature set is changing so in this case you had a say a male to female distribution where there was almost an equal acceptance and equals rejection but in this case you see there was a greater acceptance of males while uh, Uh, less acceptance for a uh, for a female now this these are the things that can help you find bias but at the same time they can also tell you that your data is drifting that you build a, a machine learning model considering a particular distribution of data and now what you're seeing is that data distribution has changed so your model may not perform in the same level that uh, it was expecting and this could be the reason why it is not why the model will be failing in production now uh, if the model is really uh, uh, built uh, very well and your uh, training samples are pretty uh, uh, the training coverage is good the model may still be able to pick up the on data drift and give the right uh, uh, prediction so the second part that comes into play here is concept drift so concept drift is when the relationship between your features and your uh, uh, target changes so they, and this is a prime example of this doing is during covid this unfortunate covid time Uh, we saw pattern of uh, uh, of purchase change. Like everybody was working from remotely, working from home. They were doing a lot of online shopping. So the pattern of uh, way the uh, the sales would happen in a brick and mortar store versus online totally changed. So there was a data drift. There was the at the same time there was a concept drift. So a lot of the prediction models that were built didn't really work. So uh, that's the concept. That's the thing about concept drift. Uh, so uh, we talked about reproducibility, transparency. next uh, and the last part and which is probably the most important is i mean you can do this in libraries technically you can put reproducibility transparency but the but the key thing is you really need accountability so you uh, what we really encourage uh, to our customers is have an ai ethics committee uh, and these sets uh, the the ethics principles i mean you you see you must have seen google facebook uh, microsoft having these uh, ai ethics uh, committees or ai prince uh, releasing ai principles but what they really need to do is uh, one is put some policy decisions like at what level do you say that your model is drifting does it does when the accuracy falls at 80% or 70% is that a uh, considered a drift and then you ask for a retraining and then you need to do auditing of these metrics i mean all these metrics it's nice to see them but you need to have some formal report which is presented to a, a audit, uh, ethics committee where you can say okay this is how your model is performing this week or uh, this month and the same thing goes with fairness reviews uh, because fan you you may end up you may be at a risk where your model is actually biased uh, though you didn't really uh, you are totally not aware of it uh, you want to do this fairness analysis some of these uh, 
things like statistical uh, parity difference and uh, equal opportunity odds you want to put them in an audit report and have a fairness review occasionally about your performance of your model so these are like uh, just some ideas i wanted to share with you on how to do reproducibility transparency accountability and uh, I, I do have a, a an example where i'm showing some of this so i'll uh, in the after the break i'll i'll we'll i'll show some couple of jupyter notebooks and we'll we'll take an example of a data scientist we'll train a model and show how we can introduce uh, reproducibility and transparency and then uh, see when that model gets deployed to production how we can monitor data and concept drift so i think once you see that uh, i mean if, if this this was not very clear i think that will also make things uh, much much more clear uh, clearer so before before getting into the next part uh, any just wanted to take a break here i mean there are a lot of ideas here and uh, I, i don't know some of you already may be working in in these areas so any i just wanted to take a break any questions on this there is one question question doctor yeah by claudio simarelli i will read for you I would like to ask you if Kubernetes is a tool that can support federated learning and your point of view of maintaining a Kubernetes system versus other orchestrators. Is it given a uh, nomad is the only other I know of. Also I'm 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 sorry to I missed the last part. What is the last sentence? Uh, the last okay, sentence okay. is nomad is the only other I know of. Oh nomad. okay yeah uh, so uh, the two questions uh, one, uh, two parts of it so regarding federated learning and kubernetes yeah that's an interesting uh, concept so the the key about federated learning is uh, you want to keep your data local you and you want to train the machine learning in a decentralized manner so uh, kubernetes kind of tries to centralize things so you kind of uh, uh, have this uh, like there is a central management of your uh, docker containers i mean to 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 my knowledge about kubernetes uh, and they can be i think i i believe they can be managed remotely so by itself you it is possible it is definitely possible to build a uh, federated learning architecture on top of kubernetes but then uh, do you really want to do that i mean that that's the thing of what is the objective of it uh, you would rather probably have a uh, an, an aggregator on kubernetes which will be managed by kubernetes and then your edge node because the whole point is to keep data local so you may not even want to have a dedicated connectivity with your local nodes and uh, uh, have your uh, have an agent run which will do the local training so you you do in federated learning you you would have this different party nodes where you do the local training and send your weight updates to a central aggregator and the aggregator will combine these updates and uh, run the analysis so if uh, the, the key key point there is you don't want to share your data with uh, with the central party so you definitely you can build it but uh, the only way, i mean the advantage i could say is performance reasons that you want to keep the data on those clusters and not share the performance but uh, otherwise you would may want to keep it uh, i mean to take the true advantage of decentralization you want to keep them as a separate nodes uh, where uh, you could have kubernetes running the federator and running your uh, the parties running their either their own kubernetes or their own docker now the other uh, mention you mention about i think nobert uh, yeah I, i'm not very familiar with it i know kubernetes uh, in the industry at least it's it's kind of become the standard there are a lot of managed kubernetes like we we, we have this uh, open data uh, red hat open shift which is more of a managed kubernetes so um, yeah i i don't know about the other other technology that you you are referring to but uh, I, i think kubernetes is something that is standardized a lot I uh, didn't answer the question. I'm not, not sure. I thought good. Okay. I, let Let me know in chat if, if there was uh, uh, if if there's any any follow up on that. Uh, so uh, one other thing. So the, these these are the so this was the uh, uh, the 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 same thing we talked about a machine learning pipeline. The different aspects like data management, model deployment, li life cycle, and uh, Uh, production deployment and these are some of the tools that are uh, currently uh, mostly these are open source tools which are heavily popular in the industry things like dvc for 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 building a data catalog your feast or hops hops for a feature store uh, ml flow for tracking your experiments of course uh, i'm sure you are familiar with jupyter notebook 
uh, there is alibi detect and evidently dot ai evidently is a new startup i mean i'm, I'm pretty impressed by them they have this nice uh, tools to do a classification report and uh, data drift and then the production deployment uh, selden is very powerful that it can do your uh, model ab testing multi arm bandit uh, things and then integrating with your regular software life cycle with jenkins and uh, kubeflow and uh, yeah so so this uh, this was kind of some of the tools and uh, let's since uh, it's 16 uh, let's take a break for uh, 10 minutes and then once i come back uh, i can show uh, some 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 of these things in action where we'll uh, try to take a data scientist perspective run a uh, build a model and uh, try to check it into a modern registry and then go take a ml ops person's perspective and actually try to uh, try to uh, deploy the model to production